Hold away here, host of The Property Couch. I've got a very special guest with me on today's Facebook Live, Nerida Connorsby, who's the Chief Economist at REA, better known as realestate.com.au. How are you? Welcome to the couch. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Hey, um, this is going to be a regular piece where we get uh, Nerida's insight. She's been a guest on The Property Couch numerous times, and we just love the way that she presents data uh, in a way that's really easy and to understand. So. First of all, we've got to talk about the elephant in the room. I mean, there's so many headlines around the fact that uh, Melbourne and Sydney have um, uh, turned the corner and the, the sentiment has changed. What, what, what do you, um, what's your response to that when people ask you that question? Because no one's buying Sydney, no one's buying Melbourne. It's, a, it's kind of a headline level. Um, do you get many people want to sort of dive into the markets within the markets or are people more fixed on just the, um, the headline? Yeah, look at it. There is a lot of discussion about markets within markets because, you know, with, with property, even in markets that have been falling for a very long time period, and, and Perth is, is the key example here, there is always some places that are more positive than others. So Sydney and Melbourne at the moment, you know, they are both going backwards, you know, we can see in terms of pricing. Um, but, you know, we are seeing a high level of variability between the two cities. You know, Melbourne does seem to be holding up a lot better than Sydney at the moment. Uh, and then even within suburbs, you know, we are seeing some suburbs obviously hit a lot harder than others and, um, and other areas doing quite well. Yeah, so I, I guess you, you, you make a really good point too because you've got um, Melbourne and Sydney who attract all the headlines, but you've got people like Perth over, you know, the Nullarbor who've been struggling for some time and, and they would be even... Um, are more disappointed in any change or any shocks to the property market like what the proposed changes to negative viewing would provide because really in 2016 when they were first mooted that was to try and take some heat out of the mm. two bigger markets. Now we've got this scenario where you know we're on record of saying the policy isn't great for property general um, but the people in, in Perth and Darwin in particular they're going to get a little bit more collateral damage from a market that probably need some propping up at this stage. Yeah, look, Perth is so tough. I, I spend quite a bit of time over there every quarter. Mm. And um, in 2017, we did start to see a recovery in Perth. Uh, pricing started to flatten out. We started to see a surge of activity on realestate.com.au, so from buyers, but also from renters. A lot of premium suburbs were picking up. So, you know, it was this really positive story. So I was over in Perth going, you know, this yeah. is it. Things are turning around. And, and they really were. But then uh, the, the Royal Commission has announced. Mm. And, you know, the, the focus has been on the impact of that announcement on Sydney and Melbourne. And for sure, it hit those markets really hard. But in Perth, you know, it just turned it back around. And, you know, in 2018, things started going backwards again. So, you know, Perth, five years into a downturn, prices back, you know, around 20%. If you go to Darwin, it's even worse. So it, it has been a very, very long time period of a downturn in both those markets. So as an economist that observes um, uh, Perth, for example, that's my hometown, um, what, what, what sort of is on the horizon for that market in terms of, um, you know, you've, you've, you've got um, commodity prices that are improving, but they, they are definitely a boom bust cycle. Do you see um, much change to that market in the, the near term, or do you think, given that they've been at the bottom, there's, there, there may be some opportunity for that market to rise? What's your yeah, view? look, I think there is opportunity for it to rise. If you have a look at uh, the fundamentals of property demand, which is jobs and population growth, that seems to be pretty good mm. in Perth. You know, we have a look at rental demand on our side. It's been up for a couple of years now. Uh, if you look at rental rises in somewhere like Cottesloe, you know, Cottesloe mm. has seen, you know, double digit rental increases over the past 12 months. And those premium suburbs are still doing really well. So, you know, Cottesloe, Peppermint Grove, Shenton Park, you know, they're all seeing some Gold decent. Triangle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Golden Triangle. So, you know, the, the West, mm. the inner West is, is doing really well. Um, the recovery, it won't be, you know, it's not going to be double digit full power ahead like it was mining boom, but it does look close to the bottom. Mm. Um, a lot of it though has to do with what's, you know, the same that's happening nationally, it's access to finance, yeah. it's incentives for investors, it's, you know, what happens with interest rates, all of those things will influence the direction of Perth this year. Can you talk us through the uh, the realestate.com.au home price index? Because you've obviously got some year on year and month on month um, uh, data around each of the capitals, but um, what, what, you know, what's interesting here is the year on year for, um, Sydney is 8%. Do you think that there's much more 
um, left in that sort of downside on their price? Yeah, look, it has gone back again in March. You know, we saw a slight decline in Melbourne and Sydney over the past month, in, and you know that that's pretty consistent. I think where where most people are thinking the markets ha should be heading. Mm. Uh, I think the big one will be the election. You know, we know in a lead up to an election, we do see fewer property listings on our site, so yeah, not new property listings. So people hold back in terms of listing volume. Um, also less buyer activity, and so so really what it looks like to us in terms of what we're seeing in terms of search activity is the markets, it's not crashing, it's just stuck. Mm. And, you know, people are delaying decision making, they're not sure what's happening. Um, the election is, you know, the big thing now because if you have a look at the start of the year, the big thing really was around what's going to happen to um, access to finance. Mm. And if anything, access to finance does seem to be easing up now. So, you know, that's less of an issue than it was in January but we still don't know what's going to happen with the election. We don't know what's going to happen to those investor incentives to get into the market uh, with negative fear and capital gains tax concessions. So, you know, that that's the one now where, you know, well, what will happen there? What will happen to the market from that point on? It's an interesting point, isn't it? Because there's so much going on. You've got an election, you've got a budget tomorrow, you've got um, uh, the Labor um, Party has announced that their policy will be from the 1st of January mm, 2020. Really so it's kind of like there's reasons to wait, there's reasons, the reasons to go and... Um, what what impact if if uh, the Labor Party's negative year in policy got through the Senate um, and it was implemented on the first of January? What impact do you see happening in the property market? Because you could have an election bump, you could have a uh, you know could could quite possibly be the busiest New Year's Eve in real estate <laughs> in <laughs> investors getting in living right? memory, right? Because it's all yeah. about the contract. So what what's your I guess you haven't had a lot of time to digest it because it only happened in the last week. But uh, what's your observations on what impact that might have? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the second half of the year will be interesting. I mean, we, the other thing that could really make things surge ahead is, is if we see an interest rate cut. Mm. So, you know, that on, my, on our side, you know, the one thing that really leads to a surge of activity is when interest rates are cut. So, you know, there, there's that that could potentially provide a boost. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Look, I don't know what the investor reaction will be. I know, I know what the investor reaction will be once the policy is introduced. For mm. sure, they'll pull back, and, mm. and that's the aim of the policy. I mean, mm. it's been put in to discourage investment in housing. Mm -hmm. So that will be the the outcome. If you're investors in housing, we can clearly, you know, we've seen what that does to pricing. It comes back, um, and we also know that it leads to a, a kick up in rental levels as well. So you know, there's these two impacts that you know, intuitively make sense, mm. but they also make sense when you have a look at the modelling that's been done, you know, pretty much both sides of government, whoever whoever's doing the modelling comes up with the same conclusion. So post 1st of Jan, you know, we've got a clearer idea. Before that, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly how investors will react. Yeah, it'd be interesting to me inside the, the, the brains trust on the Labor Party side and trying not to be, you know, trying to be as agnostic as possible, but we're talking about a policy the Labor Party, are, you know, wanting to adopt. You're in, you're in a market that is clearly taking a hit. You're in um, a, a place where the economy is, the economy's okay, but we're certainly not, um, not as strong as it was last year. Um, it'd be interesting to see what's running through their mind to think that when we, we first uh, thought about adopting this policy back in 2016, it actually made sense externally given mm. where the market was. But now it just it just really it really beggars belief that that's um, that's something that they think will you know I'm clearly biased property but that, that, that will impact not impact significantly on the the entire economy um, so I'd love to, to to know what some of the inner workings are around that discussion because to me it seems like it's um, an obsolete policy. Yeah, and I think this is a problem with trying to enact national policy on housing because on one hand you do have the problem of markets like Perth and Sydney which work in totally opposite directions, but you also have the problem that implementing policy takes a long time mm. and, you know, you can't implement it straight away and during that time the market can switch very, very quickly. Um, the other thing too, which I think hasn't been, wasn't recognised, was that investors aren't stupid and they they're not going to stick around in a market which is not financially favourable to them. And mm. that became really obvious when 2015, you know, we started to see finance restricted for investors. Um, you know, that really got tough for them in the at the end of 2017. Mm. You know, so we've, we've restricted them. The finance figures show that they've been, they've pulled back it worked, right? Well, they've just it got worked. to drop that uh, handbrake just a touch. Yeah, and it doesn't um, need much. Like it just, yeah. This this is a big handbrake. You know, we know how much investors 
do rely on negative gearing because you know in a lot of places buying on a two three percent yield with in in markets now that aren't seeing capital growth mm. you know why would you invest in rental housing in that situation if there isn't something to sort of kick you along yeah because you talk about uh, interest rates and obviously the the we'll find out tomorrow's decision um in terms of Dropping interest rates, sure, that's 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 beneficial to uh, existing um, um, loan or mortgage holders, mm. but it's not necessarily helping people who want to get in because even though the the finance is cheaper, the assessment rate's still at a yes. you know historically well, it, it's at a, a rate that seems reasonable historically, but right now. Um, those rate cuts aren't helping someone get in if they if they don't drop the assessment rate. Yeah, well. I mean it's interesting too seeing the Reserve Bank's response, and I don't know who said it, but someone from Reserve Bank said, you know, banks you need Should to be eat lending. Up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean this is your business, and and it's right, you know, in the end banks are here to lend, and that's where they make their money. So um, yeah, it would have, look, I do think ease, restrictions will ease up mm. on finance, mm. and we've already seen it from the regulators' perspective that were pulled back on mm. on the two restrictions they put on interest only and the rate of speed of investor growth. But you know now we need the banks to respond, and you know the banks are being super cautious and not surprisingly, given the Royal Commission and the the level. Yeah, of yeah. well, it's like under. a perfect storm, isn't it? Because it's ironic that um, now is a really great opportunity for buying, and you can't get finance. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> Rewind re 30 months ago. Yeah, we'll give you the lending. Yeah, no yeah, so. no shortage of money. Hey, what's your views on um, the upcoming federal budget? What What do you anticipate? And I think that's a busy time for you, isn't it, when the when the budget's announced? Yeah, so I'll be up in Canberra tomorrow yeah. in the in the budget lockup. So I think it will be a very nice budget. You know, there'll be a lot of money being flashed around, and there'll be. I mean, we already know infrastructure will be a big item. Um, they'll possibly pull ahead those um, budget uh, tax cuts mm -hmm. that they had for mm -hmm. middle income earners. Um, I don't know about what, what they'll do on housing. You know, I mean, there's been a bit of speculation that they may try and add a few more first home buyer incentives to try and counteract what the ALP want to do with mm -hmm. negative gearing. So, you know, potentially, they, I don't think they won't touch negative gearing. I don't mm -hmm. think that will be something that they'll, they'll touch. But, um, you know, we are likely to head to an election in May. That announcement's probably going to be made in a couple of days' time. So, yeah, I think the budget will be very generous, but mm -hmm. whether it actually will flow through, you know, obviously if we see change in government, we will see a change in, in what they decide to spend their money on. So do you see it um, any different to any normal pre-election budget? Are you are you seeing sensing that they'll be spending more than they normally would at the same time four years ago or in four years' time? Yeah, I mean, they're in surplus. Mm. So, you know, that that's come... Well, highly likely that's that's a rumour they are going in with a surplus. So, yeah, I think it'll be pretty generous. Mm, nice. Hey, um, tell us about um, uh, the clearance rates because you you guys on your site now can you know I've noticed that your um, the private sales uh, mm -hmm. a lot more, so we can actually see that. And in Melbourne, there's a whole lot more. Sydney, there's a whole lot more yeah. private sales than yeah. options. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting that um, just this morning the the pass-ins is significantly higher than what the success rate was for auctions over the weekend here in Melbourne. So tell us a bit about that update and what um, what sort of insights that you're um, hoping to roll out for the remainder of the year in 2019 at REA. Yeah, so um, yeah, we are tracking auction clearance rates ourselves now. So um, that, that's something new that we, we are doing. Uh, I guess, you know, at the moment what we're seeing is that clearance rates are looking pretty good, you know, compared to where they were. And, and I think one of the challenges of looking at clearance rates is that in a, you know, it's sensible for real estate agents to move from auction to private sale when mm. things get quiet, and mm. that's really what's happened. Mm. So, fewer auctions taking place, more private sales pushes up the clearance rate because, you know, why go to auction when there's, you know, you're probably not going to sell at auction. So, um, Sydney in particular, we've mm. seen a big switch away. So, Sydney's, you know, in excess of 60% at the moment. Uh, Melbourne is um, a far uh, is a city that does see far more auction activity, and that continues to be the case. And as a result, the clearance rate is slightly lower. So it's, it's, it's um, an interesting point you make, though, because you know Melbourne is and Sydney they're very much auction centric. But because of that flow away, it does give that artificial view for someone who is analysing auction clearance rates to go, oh, it's not so bad. But imagine if all of those um, private sales had stayed remained in the in the mix, it would have been. An enormous um, drop in that yeah. um, in that clearance rate. I mean, we never see the auction clearance rate get ridiculously low for that reason. Mm. And and you know what's happening in Melbourne is you know places like Werribee, which were never auction markets, went to auction markets. Mm. So things are strong, but now they're going back to private sales. So mm. you know if you if you're with a good agent, you know they they're not going to recommend you go to auction with when there's no one, no one's going to turn up at the auction. Mm. So you know it, it is a sense of response to a slime market. 
tell us, uh, well, take us inside what a lockup looks like tomorrow. What um, what what does the day um, pan out for you? What is the team like? Are you crunching numbers? What ha what impact does that have on you? Um, going through that um, that that budget juggernaut that yeah. is tomorrow. Yeah, so it's pretty full on. A lot of journalists, mm. and um, so I'm, I'm with the News Corp team, and, yeah. and we'll go in and we'll have um, we we get a big bag of documents, and there's the summary documents, and there's the in depth documents. Uh, what else happened this week? Yes, we we all sit, had to surrender our phones, get no internet access for about oh, six hours. Really? And, That's um, <laughs> uh, there you go. Yeah, just to make sure there's no leaks, right? No leaks. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so it's a lot of writing, discussion. Uh, the journalists, uh, the journalists, the politicians wander around and you know chat to people. So what is it from your perspective? Because are you just prepping tomorrow for the inevitable uh, conversations that are going to have post that, or is there a big hands-on, um, uh, I guess, involvement from you tomorrow? Yeah, so I write two articles, or I'm writing two articles. So yeah. one will be the impact on residential, one will be the impact on commercial property. Sure. Um, if there's anything really property related that's a bit out there, you know, mm -hmm. I might do another article on mm -hmm. that, you know, potentially on home loans or mm -hmm. finance, if mm -hmm. it's something related to that. Um, then you get out and then, you know, there's any, if, if it was a, I don't think it'll be a heavy housing budget, but you mm -hmm. know, if it was, it's, there's potentially more media, but then, and then, but then Wednesday, I do video for our site, so. Um, bit of a wrap up as to what's So you said, to the, you said to the family, don't expect to see me for the next 48, <laughs> yeah, 72 hours. Yeah, yeah, don't be... even try and contact me for those six hours because uh, I won't be able to do much then. Hey, quick one. You, uh, you mentioned commercial and we know that uh, real commercial is part of the suite at REA. What, um, what, what's, your, what's your views on commercial as an alternative to resi um, in the environment that we're in? Yeah, I guess the problem with commercial is that it's a high entry point, mm -hmm. so you know it's harder for people to switch. Um, at the moment, um, office and industrial are doing remarkably well. Mm -hmm. So industrial in particular, I mean, industrial has always been the one that people looked at as a you know something that wasn't really that attractive for a lot of reasons, difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but now with online retailing ramping up, there is a high level of demand for not just out of suburban big industrial sheds, but sort of you know urban areas as well. You know, a lot around distribution. Uh, office is doing really well. Um, a lot of very low vacancies, um, particularly Melbourne, now at a ten-year low mm. in terms of vacancies. So that's really positive. Mm. Uh, retail is really tough. So <laughs> yeah, you're competing with the online sort of stores, oh, it's so aren't you? Tough. Yeah. You know, I, I look at um, you know, Big W t today mm. or Woolworths today announced thirty shop for thirty stores closing over the next few years, and every week we seem to hear of stores closing or retailers shutting down. You know, but it's not everywhere. I mean, this is a thing like like residential. Like retail, you know, if you're in a in an urban retail strip that has great cafes and mm. attracts a, a big local audience, you know, you, you're probably going to do okay. So, um, and then there's development sites, which is was very hot up until about two years ago, but now you know really can't get finance, can't get the buyers, can't get financial yeah. buyers, offshore's gone. Because really you'd, you'd think that there'd be a, a bit of a, a bonanza for the new stock at once the policy, if the policy comes into play. But even even in my discussions with people who would have a, a windfall gain from the demand, they, they, they don't necessarily want to see those changes made because they want a healthy property market. And yeah, they, they also no, that's want, right. They the also want the, audience. The, yeah. the, the secondary market as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. If the if confidence drops out of the secondary market, then you know why would someone buy a new property? It doesn't, yeah. doesn't really make doesn't sense. Doesn't make sense. Hey, uh, just to just to close out today, what what does what does the economy look like um, post election uh, with Labor, and what does the economy look like post election with Liberal? From your views, and with a, well, I guess with the spotlight on what do you where do you th see the, the the main differences would be? Yeah, look, I think the Liberal Party have got an awesome track record on the economy. Um, I mean, not not everyone agrees, mm -hmm. but you know, in terms of employment, you can't. You know, even I mean, people then say, well, I don't believe the employment numbers. But even if you don't, even, you know, agree with the unemployment numbers, there's still the job ads now is at its highest level ever recorded. If you have a look at office vacancy rates, you know, they're they're particularly low. So you know, anything on the employment side, business side, does seem to be doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of problems with consumers, which hasn't been worked out as to what the problem is. Uh, the ALP, you know, they don't have the track record. So, you know, the problems we associated with negative gearing, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I get why I get why they're doing it. You know, they've they've stated the policy. They want to push ahead. Mm. You know, it's a platform for them. But mm. 
you know, I really worry about the rental market and um, I worry about, you know, we know that most rent, I mean, I could go on for this for, for another yeah, well, <laughs> half I, an hour, but, no, you know, I just Because it, it's, it, 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 it's happened rental. in 85 and brought back in 87, yeah, right? Yeah, it's um, really problematic. They've got no backup plan, so that's mm, my issue. They've, mm. they've kind of said, we're going to scrap this policy, we want to get rid of investors, we, yeah. we think they're distorting the market, which, okay, but then given almost all of our rental housing is supplied for by by individuals, like <laughs> who else is going to provide it? Yeah. So you know, there's no backup plan. So I guess that's what worries me. Um, you know, I, I I think it was interesting seeing the the Liberal win in New South Wales. Mm. You know, you could see the the, the Liberal. Job. They did a really. I mean, mm. they you know they they should have won. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, they they have done a really good job mm. in the economy, but they the Labor Party appealed to the youth vote and. You know, there were things about lock-up laws and pill testing, you know, what younger people didn't like. Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the, the battle lines at the moment is that on one hand, a lot of the, the the labour policies do appeal to younger people. You know, they feel locked out, they feel they can't afford housing. You know, there's there's things that they're very unhappy about, which I, I think they don't think the, the Liberal Party are really addressing properly. But um, have you, uh, in, in terms of talking to those people, how, how, it'd be interesting to unpack that a little bit more because I've always said that um, the generation that are struggling to get in the housing market, they, they have a choice between do they want to have lifestyle now and a delayed property ladder experience or do they want to compromise a little bit on lifestyle now and have a, a closer property experience. And, it really, and that's been the same with every generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that um, you know, there's, a, there's a panacea to helping someone who wants to get on the property market adopt it, get, save for a deposit, get into the property, even, even if it was to drop you know, fifty thousand. No, dollars. no, that's the thing. <laughs> they still... Like if they halved, maybe. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is the reality, and you're not going to see prices halve. Like, no. But you know, unless we start to see Australia lose population to anywhere else, and you know, we start to see massive drops in population, maybe. But you know, even in Japan, where we've seen huge declines in population, what happened is huge kinds of population, regional areas emptied out, and then Tokyo keeps growing. Mm, you know, so mm. it's still, you know, even in that situation, which is quite diabolical for, for a lot of Japan to hand property values, it's still the big cities that people want to be in. Absolutely. And they keep growing, so. Absolutely. I did say that was my last one, but my, my very last question was, as I was just trying to get the button right, um, uh, Royal Commission, um, what, were you, what were your sort of takeaways from that? Did you, did you, Again, from a self-interest, I, I found it interesting that they wanted to um, have a look under the bonnet of the banking's um, activities and they decided to shine a light on the mortgage brokers. It's like, well, how, how, how did that happen? I know. How did that happen? Mm. I mean, it's funny when the Royal Commission was announced that it was meant to be all about housing finance. Mm. Uh, you know, everyone was like, this is about house prices and this is going to be hit by, you know, in the end it was nothing about housing uh -huh. finance. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even touched. and. And it was about bad behaviour of banks, and then that was addressed, and then the share prices shot up with the bank. You know, it just it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, it's <laughs> abolished that industry and the share price. Yeah, goes up, so, so. yeah, and um, then, yeah. Anyway, mortgage breaking. Yeah, mortgage breaking is yeah, it's tough. I mean, also that you know, we're, we're, surveys that we've done around. Yeah, we own a mortgage breaking business, obviously, but they we know that it's mainly younger people that are using mortgage brokers because they don't understand the system. They they want someone to help guide them through it. So. You know, may, may, you know, maybe the commission structure was unfair. You know, I, I don't know, but we, you know, without a doubt, consumers like mortgage brokers, and it does help them. Well, the numbers suggest that the fact that it provides competition, it means that second and third tier lenders actually get a distribution opportunity, and that that can, you know, keeps the banks competitive and gives people choice. I think is a is a good thing. So it's good to know that. Um, that's been dialed back a little bit um, in terms of abolishing a an entire industry, but yeah. hopefully, uh, hopefully, common sense prevails there. But, um, folks, uh, as always, the time has flown. Uh, we absolutely love having Nerida Connors be on the property couch. If you want to click uh, one of the links below, we'll have some links to the conversations we've actually had um, with Nerida on the property couch. They are well worth your time. Uh, she, as I said, she explains economic data in a way that's easily digestible and hopefully uh, makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. But uh, Nerida Connorsby, thanks for coming back onto the property. Yeah. Thanks for having me.